Uh, yes, that was a marvellous sweep, and I thoroughly enjoyed it. I asked you a lot of questions before we came in about, um, <coughs> whether the, the generals and the militaries of the world are beginning to realise that hard power and diluted military power doesn't work anymore in achieving objectives and persuading people to do things they don't want to do. And that uh, new methods of communication and civilian objectives and techniques have to be bound up with military, traditional military hard power. Is, is, that a, is that a thought as we look to the future and the rise of Asia that is in, in uh, the policy thinking of uh, the PRC? And, mm -hmm. Is it something that is examined in that I notice they're spending a lot of money on soft power um, agencies, Confucius centers and so on. Uh, just say a word on that. Yes, I, I, your, your question you posed before we came in here made me think about what one calls, this is, this is a very, very big strategic effort. There's no question, this is, this is colossally important in global international relations. I don't see it as, as, I think power is the wrong word. I think this is, uh, China historically has not gone beyond today's borders. Uh, it attempted very briefly uh, a, to go beyond the present borders, but that was a long, long, long time ago. And I think China means it when it says dealing with 1.3 billion people is enough. And so I don't think China is so interested in, in soft power. I think it's, I would like to, I can't think of a, a word to call it, but I think it is interested in the, a peaceful, cooperative world. And we always, we always tend to think in zero, to, in, in zero sum terms. I, I think Chinese culture, uh, with the idea of, it sounds very banal, but I think the essence of yin yang thinking is all about balance and about the idea of dynamic tension producing something useful which is non-zero sum. We do something together and something better comes out of it. That's my uh, sentiment from having read quite a lot and studied a little bit about, about that culture. So I think soft power is looking at it always through our eyes, which is, which is, which is zero sum game. And I think Xi Jinping is, is, um, uh, really has touched upon something very deep uh, for a cooperative world in the 21st century. And there is a very interesting phrase in, in Confucius, which everybody who studies China knows about, which is how you respond uh, to people who push you and are unpleasant towards you. And this phrase is about the, the idea of how you respond is, is three possibilities, how you respond to people who push you. The first is to respond um, with the same as they give you, you and by you. So you give people back, whack them in the nose. This is a very simple principle. The second principle is Kevin will correct my pronunciation, which is to respond by just turning the other cheek and say, I'm, I'm, I'm a nice person, hit me. But I think if you want to understand the South China Sea, and the Air Defense Identification Zone, for example, ADIZ in the East China Sea, and China's interaction over the South China Sea, the third response is the one which is yi zhi ba yuan, which is zhi is about firmness. It's not about hitting, it's about telling the truth and being firm. That's not the same thing as soft power. And so I think those are just some thoughts, but I do believe that's what China is after. Kevin, is that all right? <laughs> you want to ask a question? Yeah, just to follow on that answer. Uh, so, what do you see are the chances of China managing to persuade the Western powers, especially the US, that there can be a different way, politically, not zero sum? Yeah. Well, I think the person who can answer that is the ambassador. <laughs> he went for the best person to give the answer. I'm very confident uh, that um, it'll be a long, complex process. Uh, I, think, I think the embedded institutions and ideas uh, from the Cold War are very, very, are, are very deep indeed. And I think to understand we must, everybody must understand, try to understand each other. And I've been trying to think recently about 
how legitimate, you know, where did the Cold War come from? And if you read, for example, the most influential text on what the Soviet Union considered itself to be, this was the book by Bukharin and Kravigansky, published in 1920 during the Civil War, called The ABC of Communism. All the communists outside China, outside the Soviet Union, read this in the 20s and 30s. And that is very blunt, you know, they said communism means the whole country as a single factory. No market economy, no profits. It also said that it will be legitimate for us, as the dictatorship of the proletariat, to conduct terror, to achieve and to continue in power. The revolution for us is about a small minority seizing power. But actually is not what Marx said. I mean, the Communist Manifesto talked quite specifically about the dictatorship of the proletariat being the rule of the great majority of the people in the interest of the great majority of the people. That's what Karl Marx said in the Communist Manifesto. But if you want to ask where the Cold War came from, the nature of communism, particularly in the Soviet Union, for understandable reasons, understandably produced that response in the West. And of course, China, after a very diverse, eclectic period in the 1950s, um, for example, I was reading a book recently about a study of Yangzhou, and Yangzhou in the late 1950s had hundreds of people who were still publicly performing these great long sagas of, of, of Chinese folk tales, like the Xiaoji, like the Journey to the West. And one of these people was recorded who, I think he was able from memory to speak on 120 different days for about two hours without a note. That was the late 1950s, and people say, oh, you know, this dictator, this is just not true. The 1950s was a very, very different, open, eclectic time in China. But of course, a very different culture prevailed from the late 50s to the mid, that's a fact, it's 1976. Many positive features, but also many features. You know, a picture of a gentleman coming out of the Chinese embassy with an axe threatening a British policeman, you know, didn't help to, to make people feel relaxed about, about communist China. This is just a joke. This is the truth. So the answer is, the Cold War, you know, you can understand uh, really where it came from. It doesn't mean it was right. And I think the embedded sentiments about communism and about China are still with the end of the Soviet Union, which when you, I tell you, when you go to Uzbekistan and you realize the achievements of that part of the Soviet Union under communism, you realize how, you know, how there were many good things despite many bad things in the Soviet Union. It wasn't very well understood, but it's not a surprise that we had a Cold War. So I think it'll take time for that Cold War sentiments like tea, you know, or like coffee going through the filter. It'll take time to work its way out. And I'm very confident. I think, I think China is very patient, and I think Yi Zhi Baiyuan illustrates that. It will take time. I think Xi Jinping's New Silk Road is also Yi Zhi Baiyuan. And I don't, the idea that China's going to do something stupid is for the birds. It's not going to. I don't think so. I, I can't imagine it. Therefore, I think it'll just take time. But the biggest difficulty is definitely coping with the United States. Uh, European states also in different ways have problems. But I think just keep talking, keep talking, and gradually, 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 I think things will be resolved. Uh, and it's not just, just not China. You know, I, I think many other parts of the world in Central and Southeast Asia will also join this. And I think in the end, even Japan will join this. And I, I'm very confident. No, in the long term, I'm personally very confident, maybe misplaced, but I do think so. So that's, that's, Hello, yeah. Better give it up. Professor, I want to say a big thank you for your great speech about Chinese history. I love my country's history. I'm proud of my country's history. And uh, I know in this modern world there are many people from other countries who haven't had the chance to understand or to learn about our history or our culture deeply. So I understand if they feel a bit nervous about the recently China's economic growth. But I want to tell everybody here one thing. In China we say, some people here, some English gentlemen here, or wherever you come from, I know you understand Chinese, and I know Professor you do, and some of my friends here do as well. In China we say, 兵者刀也, 
yong zhi bu xiang, which means mandatory is a dagger. Using mandatory is unlucky. So no one in this world needs to worry about China. It's going to get big and try to harm anyone else. We do have a bit of a, not culture, but bad behavior to ourselves. But in our history, except the greatest Pingis Khan, we never, Chinese, intruded any other country. So I want to say a great thank you to everybody who paid their concerns to China in the business way or any other ways. And I want everybody to try to learn a bit more about Chinese people and our government. We are one of the kindest nation that if you want to be friend with. Thank you very much. question alludes to the fear of China's rise and it is very very widespread uh, and it is a part of it is, is not easy to explain I think particularly the role of the mass media is extremely important in sentiments about China and I don't fully understand uh, where those sentiments come from and I think I, my simple answer which is probably inadequate is this is a leftover from the Cold War, but that's the answer I talked about in relation to Kevin's question, but that's clearly not entirely adequate uh, in the sense that the Soviet Union uh, has now gone. Uh, China's communism is a very different kind of communism from 1976. And so maybe it's not just a hangover from anti-communism, but it's something rather deeper, maybe something more fundamental uh, that's not just about communism, but is also about the difficulty of the powers that have dominated the world for 200 years giving up that position in the world. That's, that's, that's a psychological question. And in fact, one of the most interesting books, maybe the most interesting book in international relations, was by Senator Fulbright, who was the chairman of the US Foreign Relations Commission for, I think, 20 odd years. And his book, The Arrogance of Power, he spoke very powerfully and very simply about a little studied aspect of international relations, which is psychology. And part of this is about the psychology, even like the psychology in a family where one child starts to grow up. So while I do think that the legacy of the Cold War is very, very important, I would not underestimate the role of psychology, even the role of racism, in the difficulty of Western people accepting that it's China, but if it was India, the response could equally be the same. In accepting that another part of the world, which we have ruled and dominated, uh, becomes powerful in world affairs. So it's a combination, not just of the answers I gave to Kevin, of, of the legacy of, of anti-communism, but also some very fundamental questions about human psychology. And I think Fulbright's remarks are, are well worth rereading on that score. Okay. Uh, Peter. Um, you know, uh, I'm uh, fortunate to be a trustee together with Lord Broyles of uh, the Needham Institute. And uh, when I became a trustee of the Needham Institute, 
and I've had the fortune to, to know him, uh, it was said in his obituary that he was probably the greatest academic since Erasmus. And uh, I don't want to encourage your passing or talk about you in terms of other people, but I think what we heard tonight was one of the greatest uh, uh, explanations of the history of the Silk Roads. And we're all very much indebted to you for the hours and hours of research and uh, learning that you have applied to this subject that's given us the opportunity to understand the importance historically of the Silk Road. And then after that, to talk in the terms you did with the questions about the implications of that for the future. We have in the last few days, Peter, seen some very interesting uh, issues unfolded with the CICA conference, the uh, China-Russia um, gas deal, um, Chinese proposals at APEC. The world is changing around us as we stand here and we can't quite see it. And to have the opportunity to have you come here and put it in perspective for us is a great honour and a great uh, benefit to us all. So thank you, Peter, for being here and for what you said.